Hey all, Jordan Connect here with another episode of Embrace the Chase ETC Talk, where the Chris Brubaker podcast and I get together three times a week and uh, go over some topics that are passionate uh, with us in our own lives, but also to bring on some guest speakers where we can talk about what their specialization is and see if there's anything we can learn from it and apply to our lives as well. And I'm pumped up tonight because Chris and I have the honor of having Jonathan P. Jackson on tonight, who is a real estate investor out in California. Uh, as well as a uh, real estate broker, if I'm getting all of this correct. Uh, mm-hmm. and he's the head of Jackson's team. Uh, and before I butcher what exactly that is, because you were saying, because I know nothing about real estate, but you said it's hedging. Is that correct? Um, so Jackson's team is there's two entities. The one is a team where we help people buy and sell real estate on the retail side, along with investors. The second one is an investment firm, and that's where we raise capital and we lend it out on first trustees. So I, I won't get too much into that because it, it gets complicated. So we'll keep, uh, depending on the audience, we'll keep um, we'll keep the knowledge at a good level. <laughs> well, I love it. So my specialty, guys, as you know, is social media marketing. But I'm going to pass this off to Chris Brubaker, who is a real estate investor, and kind of let him take it from here. Hey, what's going on, guys? Uh, good to see you again. For those of you that are tuning in, Jonathan, thank you again for joining us, man. Uh, we were talking before we got started, and you said that you've been doing some real estate investing for the last four years. Um, and, and we're going to kind of make this a conversation, so it's not going to be too interview-esque, but um, I think the big question to kind of start off is, is what drew you to real estate, and what drew you to real estate investing? Yeah, so I was in the Marine Corps, um, and in there I was living paycheck to paycheck, and I was kind of bummed out. I called my dad. I'm like, hey, dad, can I get a handout, basically? And he said no, and he said, Jonathan, maybe you should start learning what the wealthy have done or what the wealthy do. So I started studying the wealthy and it looked like majority of them were involved in real estate, businesses, stocks, hedge funds, banking, oil, and a few other few other uh, entities. So I took that knowledge. I said, okay, I'll start with real estate. I'll start learning that one. Um, read a book named Rich Dad, from Rich Dad Poor Dad. Not the Rich Dad Poor Dad book, but uh, it was Retire Young, Retire Rich by his company, Rich Dad Poor Dad. Um, oh yeah, it might be right there in the back of your, on your bookshelf. But um, <laughs> so I got out of the Marine Corps. And I went dove right into real estate. The last year in the Marine Corps, I was studying every day, every night, just reading books. And prior to that, I could barely read. <laughs> Literally, I was a slow reader. But I also learned that um, the wealthy read. And I said, I'm just going to copy and paste what they're doing and implement it in my life. So I got out, um, started interviewing people that were at different levels in real estate. And I realized that the possibilities were endless. And then I just tackled it from there. That's awesome, man. Very cool. So and that's one thing that we are huge on here with this with this channel. What we do is reading, uh, being lifelong learners. And, and just to hear that from another guest is phenomenal because I don't think that people can hit on that enough. A lot of people, uh, I don't know, like me, I decided after high school I was going to quit reading. I was like, I'm done. I don't need to read anymore. I'm all set. But with the amount of knowledge that's out there, it really people need to have something and learn from somebody or maybe through a book, you know, or through a, a podcast channel or, or I don't know, a TV show. I don't know. But something to kind of continue to move themselves forward. And kind of to talk on that, um, let's kind of dive a little bit deeper into your investing side. I know you do some things with um, with Paul Wall Banker and everything. But for you and your investment side and what you're building in your portfolio, uh, can you explain to us uh, kind of what your your process looks like as far as your real estate investing? Okay, so there's there's multiple um, pillars to real estate investing. I'll start with one, and it's flipping. A lot of people have heard that. They go to the half-day seminars and whatnot. Um, how that really works is, okay, on average in my area, every area is different. In my area, you can find deals that, that are about 33% below market value if you have connections. And with those connections, you get them at 33% after closing costs on the purchase side, your renovation costs, holding costs, utilities, everything like that, taxes, insurance, and then uh, resell closing costs. You can expect to net 10% um, on the project in four months. Now, now then, sometimes people leverage because the deals usually have to go cash, but you can use hard money or private money. Um, some people like to leverage hard money. And then your return actually increases even though, even though you're making less. And the reason why is because a return is usually – uh, measured off of cash in the project, right? So if I initially bought a house for two hundred thousand, or I bought it for one fifty, and after all expenses, I was in at two hundred, resold it for two forty five, and netted two twenty, that would be a twenty thousand dollar gain on my two hundred thousand dollar project. 
which would be 10% cash on cash in four months. Now, if I leverage hard money at 1% a month on a hundred thousand dollars, I'll keep it. I, I promise this <laughs> photo. So if I leverage hard money at 1%, 1% a month, which is 12% a year, you don't want to hold it long term for four months. That's going to be 4% of my hundred thousand dollars. Now that makes my net only $16,000 on my hundred thousand dollars that I have in the project. So that would make my return actually 16%. And these returns, that's huge. When you think about uh, a CD, you get 3% a year or, or even in the stock market, you, you, the average a mutual fund, I believe is like 6% a year. Now we're getting 16% in four months. Well, not even that. I mean, the 16% that you're getting is, I mean, isn't even off your own money. Cause you said hard money lending, right? Well, so, so the 16% is off your own money. If you calculate it that way, because off the project, if it was only $16,000 net, um, on a $200,000 project, it would be a uh, eight, uh, 8%. But if you did it all cash, you wouldn't have to pay that for, I calculated $4,000 of interest, which was a thousand dollars a month on the hundred thousand you borrowed. So then, uh, you end up netting 16,000, but you only have a hundred thousand out of pocket. So you net 16% cash on cash rather than rather than uh, 10% without leverage. Well, just a follow-up question for you, Jonathan. Um, how often do you use hard money lending for 100% of a project or do you usually put skin in the game? Um, well, most hard money lenders want you to have skin in the game, but if the project is such a great deal, then they'll lend 100%. But you'll see ads for 100% lending or you might know people who will do it, but uh, usually majority of the time the interest rates higher and they add points and fees and, and like double appraisals, sometimes two appraisals just to make sure their money's safe, which I completely agree with. Great idea. But, um, it's, I usually, uh, advise people to put a little bit of skin in the game only because it makes the money easy, find the money easier and then we get it at a better rate as well, rather than paying all the points and junk fees. Gotcha. Okay. Well then let's kind of go back to the beginning here until Chris is able to jump back on for people that are brand new to real estate investing, have no idea what they're doing, hard money lending, all these words being thrown around. I know they're confused. What in your opinion is the best place to start as a brand new real estate investor? As a brand new real estate investor, I would, uh, I would go to the, those free half day seminars, the, um, you know, learn from people who have already done it. And honestly, just think of it this way. I'm just going to be all over the place here, but I want to get a few points out. Think about consumer versus investor. So if you have an investor mindset, you basically have to shift your mindset and then you'll start seeing the opportunities. It doesn't have to be real estate, but since I'm in real estate, I'll, I'll kind of aim it that way. But basically a mindset. If I get paid, uh, let's say $10,000 for the month, am I going to spend it all on my car payment, my house, my vacation, new watch, whatever it is, or am I going to... Uh, use that money to invest. And then that money builds interest, which builds interest on interest, which is called, you know, the compounding effect. So, so where they should start is it's education. It's definitely education. Okay. And then in 15 minutes, you know, we're, there's a short uh, podcast. It's not going to, you know, we're not going to be able to tell them all, all of it. You know, it takes years and years of learning. You want to be the expert, but here, here's the secret is look at, you know, study the wealthy, look at McDonald's, they lease the buildings to the franchisees. They're the biggest real estate owner, I think, in the world. I'm not sure. I'll double check. But and if you look at all the hedge funds, what do they do? They own the apartment buildings. They own the malls. You look at you look. You go to your city right now. Go to L.A., New York. The names on the buildings. It's uh, commercial firms, hedge funds and banks, uh, commercial real estate firms. Sorry. There's a reason for that. Follow the money. It shows it has trends like it's not it's not rocket science. I like it. Well, then kind of a separate question. I'm not sure if it's different out in California. Uh, Cole Hatter is a guy that I've followed with on real estate. Um, but what's kind of your opinions on wholesaling? Um, wholesaling? I'm a fan of it, but there's not there's not that many uh, opportunities. You have to really you have to really hit the pavement. You have to really make the calls and go out there. You have to put yourself out there to get the wholesale deals. Um, they are available. You know, this year, uh, me and a couple of my investors are uh, I'm not sure how many we wholesale, but definitely a handful. And there were some good ones where we would make. Uh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you about one one uh, wholesale project we did. Asset manager from New York gave us a call, said he needs to liquidate the liquidate this property. My uh, my buddy bought it. He's a broker as well. He bought it personally. He's like, oh, I'll buy this. It's a great deal. Um, no one saw the opportunity that I saw, so I gave him a call. I said, uh, I said, Craig, I'll I'll, I'll net you. Um, what was it? I think it was like twenty. $2,000. So I'll net you $22,000 in one day if you'll sell it to my investor. 
And he's like, he's like, make it 25 and you got a deal. So we got it to like 24 or five, we got as close as we could. Um, sells it to my investor, which is a little hedge fund in uh, um, Carlsbad area. And then I already had someone lined up to buy it from him. They bought it from him at, uh, so we bought it from the gentleman at 268, plus I got my commissions in there. He bought it from the, the bank. It was a, okay. So the bank acquired another bank because it was in it was in default. And then my broker buddy bought it from that bank. And then we bought it from my broker buddy. And then we sold it to another investor wholesale. I built a relationship with that other investor and they're going to resell it. And there's plenty of room for everyone to make money. I guess the only person who doesn't make a bunch of money is the original bank who went in default, huh. unfortunately. <laughs> That's super cool. I love it. Yeah. It, it basically got passed down the line. And everyone made, you know, between like twenty-five or more thousand dollars, and it was a, it, this all happened within like a three-week period every hand. But uh, I mean, it varied. Not all projects are that easy and fun, but uh, yeah. For those of you that are watching right now, if you have any questions, definitely throw them down below. Uh, we can see we've got probably about 15 people live right now on. So if you have any questions, throw them down below. We'll add them up. Um, and real quick clarification, for those of you that do not know what wholesaling is, it's basically finding um, an opportunity, putting it under contract, and then selling it off to somebody that contract and making a spread. Um, that's like the simplest way I could describe it. But Chris, are there any other questions that you kind of had? Yeah, uh, Jonathan, did, when you got into real estate investing, was it because you were in the in the game with Coldwell Banker, or was it something you did prior to um, to that? Um, so I was initially on the retail side, and I still am. I love the retail side. I'll help a homeowner buy a house, sell a house. I'll go above and beyond too because I'm uh, I love work and I love what I do. But um, I, I started networking with the people who were who were where I wanted to be. And I, I realized that even if they're on the doing the day to day working um, for commissions, they're also investing in real estate. They're also um, flipping properties, buying long term. I mean, think of, think about this. If if I go to the bank right now and I say um, I need to borrow two hundred thousand dollars to buy Apple stock, they're going to say, oh, well, I can't help you there. Get out. Get out of here. But if I say the same thing, I said, I have this property I want to buy for two hundred thousand. Can I borrow you know one ninety? Can I put five percent down, three and a half percent down FHA? 3% down conventional, 5% down conventional. Um, it's more likely they'll approve me for that. I apologize. I'm looking all over the place because I got a few things on my screen and they're all, they're all just as good to look at, but, um, they're all good. <laughs> so, so, uh, the point is they lend it because they know it's a safe investment. They might say, Jonathan, are we at the peak of a market? Well, well, here's the thing. Um, the peak of a market will come and go. So if you're buying long-term, if I'm buying for, uh, rental opportunities or long-term holds, I'm going to win no matter what. So, so the way our, our financial system is set up, it's set up for inflation. So, so yeah, it might drop, but then it's coming back up and it might drop again, but it's coming back up and it might drop again, but it's coming back up. So if you're trying to time the market, you're just going to miss out on opportunities. So what you need to do is hedge your bets. That's why I mean, that's where the hedge funds get named hedge funds. You have, to hedge, you have to hedge your bets. So you might say, okay, if I'm flipping now, what will be my cap rate if I have to hold this as a rental? Does this make, I mean, uh, let me, let me, let me touch on a little bit of that. So a cap rate is your return on investment on a rental property. How much, you know, if my, if I'm paying a mortgage and I have 10,000 in it because I bought it as a primary residence and I moved, moved across state or whatever for a job, um, I have 10,000 in it. Let's say it's $200,000 property and my mortgage is, uh, whatever X, but I'm getting X plus 200. Then I would take 200 net. If I'm netting $200, 200 times 12 would be uh, uh, 2,400 and then divide that by what I have in it, which would be um, $10,000. That means I'm getting a 24% return on my money. So you just keep, you just keep replicating it. You know what I mean? So, so as long as you have a long-term strategy, even during your short-term gains, you'll be okay. You can head yourself for bets. And plus the younger you start, the better, uh, you know, you have time on your side to win because of the financial system, how it's set up. And one, one last thing on that, um, I track what the billionaires are doing because I'm like, oh, let's just learn from what they're already, you know, learn from the best. And so not the best, depending on what realm, you know, if it's a spiritual realm, I'll learn from the spiritual guru. If I want to be a great father, I'll learn from great fathers. If I want to be a billionaire, I'm going to learn from a billionaire uh, financially. And then if I want to be, a, you know, in shape, I'm going to learn from someone in the health industry. So with that being said, um, so the billionaires are betting on mega inflation, but maybe they're only betting on mega inflation because they're on long term strategies anyway. So it doesn't matter. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So.
Um, are you saying like just just rewind? You say betting on mega inflation. Are you responding to like the fact of our fiat currency possibly crumbling? Um, well, here's here's the thing. Um, a few years ago, they did what's called quantitative easing, and it's where they put money into circulation. Um, it's called like forceful inflation. I mean, there's multiple ways to do forceful inflation: population growth, um, government policy, quantitative easing, and there's just there's just a handful. I mean, there's little ones and there's big ones. Well, quantitative easing is the big ones where they actually put twenty trillion dollars into our circulation organically, and so <laughs> that's why the stock market's like. Ooh. Anyway, they were originally going to buy it back in bonds, and they only ended up buying back. A, very minimal amount. It was supposed to be 60 billion. A, I think it was like 60 billion a month they were supposed to buy back, and they ended up buying back 30 billion a month for a short term instead of buying it all back. The, what that means is we have inflation coming, but maybe the, the problem why you can't really guess it is because maybe we're already there, or maybe that was just to catch us up to where we were. So, so you can't really you can't really judge the market. But luckily, the system is set up that way that if you that. Even if you get caught in a dip, as long as you have your long-term strategy, you'll be okay. That's awesome. Hey, man, uh, one quick question as we kind of wrap the show up. If you had to impart some knowledge to our audience, uh, like a book recommendation or something that's helped you to get to where you're at and what you're doing with real estate investing, what would that be? Um, well, I got a couple of books here that I like to recommend because they, uh, they always – these are game changers for life. It doesn't matter the industry, really. And then you pick your industry and, and then learn from the best. Um, but here's one. How to win friends and influence people. A lot of people who are uh, self-help gurus or that are growing in life, they, they always read that book because one, it'll make your life. There you go. Retire young, retire rich. It'll, it'll honestly, uh, how to win friends and influence people. The title is kind of deceiving because honestly, it makes you uh, like a better person. It makes you actually like um, present in the moment when someone's telling you a story or talking. You're actually present. You're actually listening. You're learning. Um, I did a lot of talking during this interview. And we're doing this podcast. And um, the one thing I'd say is when you talk, you're not learning anything new. You're only repeating what you already know. But when you listen, you can learn something new. So I'd say read that book, Think and Grow Rich. And then one more. If you're a realtor um, or a real estate broker, the millionaire real estate agent, if you want to be an investor, there's the exact same. There you go. I was going to say, you have yeah, the millionaire real estate investor. And that's that's full of gold. And actually, the numbers in there are correct for right now. Different periods, they're not always correct, but right now that one's uh, spot on. Two more questions for you, and I'm going to give you both to you at the same time. First one's going to be, who are your biggest mentors, whether they're in-person mentors or not? And then the last question we asked every single one of the people that come on the show, uh, what's on your heart right now or what's on your mind that you either want people to know about you or some other topic? Um, <clears throat> kind of heavy. <laughs> Yeah, so on 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 my on my heart right now, uh, I'd probably say like lately I've been thinking about how short life is and how to embrace moments with people. Um, I just had a birthday on Friday, and uh, it it just like every year is coming quicker. And I and I, I'm still young, but but I remember looking back five years ago like it was yesterday, and then five years before that like it was two days ago. And every time I blink, it's like boom, boom, boom. And then when I talk to uh, like my father or somebody else that's older, they always say, um, uh, you know, I remember, I remember it when I was your age, like it was yesterday. And I'm like, Oh no, that means I'm going to be there before you know it. Existence, you know, existence is only limited. So do what you love, enjoy life. And that's, that's basically it. I'm going to leave it off with that. Well, guys, for those of you that are on right now, definitely check down the link below. Uh, I don't know if it's there right now, but I'm definitely going to tag Jonathan's uh, page. Reach out to him. He's incredible. Who you see here right now is who he really is. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to shoot him a message. Or if he's impacting your life in some way, don't hesitate to send a thank you note his way. But really appreciate having you on, Jonathan. Chris, any uh, last thoughts? Jonathan, man, thank you for your service for the Marine Corps and everything. I know it's you know Veterans Day weekend. And, man, we appreciate you coming on and just sharing some of the knowledge you've learned and what you're currently doing uh, with us. I know it's impacted us and with our audience, too. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Awesome, man. We'd love to have you on again in the future, but appreciate it, and you have a great night. You too. Thank you.